All right, 2 Peter chapter 1. We'll be focusing in on kind of the first portion of the chapter here where we get this list of, of having faith and adding to your faith uh, virtue and adding to virtue knowledge and, and continuing on down this list. And the title of my sermon this morning is, is Christian Life Essentials. Christian Life Essentials. So obviously uh, we're talking about, when I say the word Christian, I'm talking about people who are born again, people who are believers, people who have faith. And these essentials are things that you need to have. And we're going to go through this list individually and kind of focus on each one. And the purpose of this is for you to, to reflect on yourself and see, you know, inflect and see if there's an area or areas where you really need to be working on to improve. I, you know, we obviously all should be continually trying to improve in our Christian life and our walk with God. And, and if you have this attitude like you've arrived and that, well, I'm just doing the most I could possibly do. I'm the best Christian I could possibly be. I'm the number one Christian in the world. You've got a lot to learn because you're not. <laughs> OK, and that, that's a wrong attitude. It's a bad attitude. It's a lifted up attitude. We need to remain humble. We need to continue to grow. We ought to be growing in our faith, in the practice, in everything, in every aspect of our life until the day that we breathe our last breath. We ought to be striving to grow and to improve uh, in our life. So we're going to focus on these various things. And this is extremely important because look at what it says here. We're going to jump down to verse number eight. We're going to go back through everything. But when he gives all these different attributes, in verse number eight, the Bible says, for if these things be in you, and abound. So it's not good enough just that you have a little bit of each one of these things. He said, these things be in you and abound. I mean, you are just full of and overflowing with all of these various attributes, with the virtue, with the knowledge, with, with all these different things. He says, if they be in you and abound, they make you that ye shall neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You want to be a fruitful, you want to actually be producing something for God. You want to have a life that's, that's, God can look down at you and be like, wow, there is a good servant. So when you breathe your last breath, you go home to be with the Lord. He says, well done, now good and faithful servant. You've been fruitful. You've been doing everything that I want you to do. You've been reproducing. You've been bringing forth much fruit. This is where we want to be. Well, if all of these things that we're going to cover this morning are in you and they abound, the Bible says you will be fruitful. They will make you be fruitful. If you have these attributes, you're guaranteed to be fruitful. Amen. So we're going to focus on all these attributes. But then he goes further, not just, you know, he gives you the good news. Hey, if you have all this stuff, you're going to be fruitful. But look what it says in verse number nine. But he that lacketh these things. So you're saying if you don't have these things, he's blind. You're blind. You can't see afar off and hath forgotten that he was purged from his old sins. So this is talking about a believer, someone who's purged from his old sins, but he's saying, if you don't have all these attributes after getting saved, if you're not working on this, if you're not improving and abounding in these things, you're blind. You can't see very far. It's like you've forgotten that you even were saved to begin with. And, and he draws a stark contrast. I mean, it's like hot, cold, on, off, one or the other. You either have these things or you don't. Let's work on these things. And like I said, you're never going to be at the point where like, well, I've got this. Just I have all faith. I can't improve any more on my faith because it's just maxed out. No, we're always adding to. So add to your faith. Add to knowledge. Add to this. And, and, he, and we go down the list. Now, the list actually makes sense in the order that it's in also. I'm going to kind of cover that a little bit. But it's not something where you just need to be like, okay, I'm only focused on faith, and when that's full, then I'm moving to the next step. That's not the way this works, okay? Even though the, the order kind of makes sense, we ought to be kind of cycling through and working on these and increasing in all areas as much as we can. So, and, and you may have one area that's kind of lacking, but when you get that, especially the further down that list it is, that will help you with all the rest of them going forward. It, it, you know, wh wh whatever area you're lacking in will help you. The more faith you have, it's going to help you in all the rest of these areas. Because what's faith? Faith is the, the um, you know, having the hope or the trust in things that are not seen, right? We don't see things, but we take it on faith. We can't physically see the Lord, but we have faith that he exists. We didn't 
witness the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have faith. We're trusting in that to, to save our souls. So um, the more faith you can have in God's word, it's going to help you with all the rest of these these uh, virtues and, and these principles, or these characteristics, I should say, in the Christian life. Now, starting here in verse number one, let's jump back up to verse number one. The Bible says, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. So he's addressing this epistle basically to believers. He's saying, from Simon Peter to them that have obtained like precious faith. Other people that are faithful, other people that are believers. Grace and peace be multiplied unto you through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord, according to as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness through the knowledge of him that hath, that hath called us to glory and virtue, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. And then he continues on here, verse 5, and beside this, so beside all this, beside these great promises, beside everything that, he, that he's mentioning here, he says, give all diligence. Diligence means, I mean, you're focused on this. You're paying attention. You're, you're putting a priority on this. I'm going to be very diligent to make sure that this is going to happen. Give all diligence. Add to your faith virtue. And then he goes, he continues to go on the list, but we're going to stop. I'm going to, I'm going to go through each one of these elements and just focus in. We're going to be diligent to kind of look at each one and not just read over them. You may read your Bible every day, but, but many times we just read over things because you're reading your Bible. Maybe there's nothing is standing out to you. You're just reading. We're going to go through and focus in on each one. So we're giving good due diligence to all of these various characteristics that we ought to have and that, that we ought to be abounding in in order to make sure that our Christian life is fruitful in the eyes of God and that we're not ourselves blind. So everything starts with faith. That's what verse 1 starts with. It's with that faith. And obviously the faith that, br you know, that brings salvation is, is first and foremost and number one, and nothing else is going to matter if you're not even saved, right? But in addition to the saving faith, to the faith where, that your faith is on the Lord Jesus Christ to, to make you a new uh, creature, a child of God, there is other faith that we ought to have as well. That it's just faith, like I was saying, in the things that are not seen. Faith in God's word, trusting in, in all of his promises, trusting in his word to guide us and to be a lamp for us and, and having that faith that we can walk by faith and not by sight so that the things that we see aren't going to influence us as much as what God's word says. That faith and adding to that faith. And that's why I was saying, you know, it, it's not just talking about your faith because that's done. If you have faith in Lord Jesus Christ to save you, amen. You know, you're good as far as being born again, being saved. But we want to increase our faith. As the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. Right? Jesus Christ said, if you have faith as a grain of a mustard seed, you can say unto this mountain, you know, be removed. And, and, and you know, he said, that's going to be done unto you. I'm sorry, the, the verse was in my mind and popped out just as fast as it popped in there. But he's able to, uh, you know, we're, we're able to do so much through faith, and it's just a little faith that's required. We just read the story in, in Wednesday of Peter getting out of the boat and walking on water, right? And we can look at that and say, how much faith does it take to actually step out of a boat to walk on water? And then as soon as he starts to sink, Jesus is like, wherefore did you doubt, O ye of little faith? He's like, you've got a little faith. He's walking on water. He had so much faith in Jesus Christ that he said, hey, just, just call me out there and I'll come out to you. And he did. And he was able to walk on that water and Jesus still ended up saying that he had little faith because he started to doubt. I bring that up just to demonstrate how we have a lot of room to grow in our faith. But faith doesn't, it, it doesn't end there. That's the beginning. Having a faith, even as we continue to increase our faith and, 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 and trust in God more and more, 
We need to add to that faith. And the first thing he says to add to that faith is virtue. Now, virtue is a word that's not used many times in the Bible, but it's not very difficult to understand, even just in the context. And I like it when there's words that you don't understand, it's a good idea to check out other places they're used in Scripture so we get a biblical usage of the word. Because oftentimes you can have words that have multiple definitions if you go to a dictionary. And I'm not saying dictionaries are bad, but you have to take into consideration the context and the way that words are used. And especially when we're looking at when we're using a book that was translated into English in the 1600s, there are some words that have changed their meanings over time. So if you're looking at a modern dictionary, it might not quite give you the exact meaning the way that the word was intended to be used in the 1600s. But to, to help with that, one of the easiest ways to do that is just find the other places where these words are used and you can use some common sense in looking at the word and say, oh, okay, now I'm starting to get the picture of how this word is being used, right? And it'll help you to understand what the words mean when you start seeing it used in different situations in the context. Uh, that, that'll help you out probably even more than a dictionary will uh, of just getting that understanding of seeing, oh, okay, I could see how this fits in now. Uh, all that being said, though, you know, there's a few times the Bible where, where where Jesus, there's a story of people, you know, the woman touching his garment and was healed of the, the, the issue of the fountain of her blood. And when Jesus turned around, he, he, he was able to sense that virtue departed from him. But ultimately what virtue is, is, is virtue is just like goodness. It's, 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 it's doing good. It's, it's, uh, you could compare virtue with vice, right? Those two are kind of opposites of each other. Vice is doing evil, sin bad things, virtue would be doing good things. And it's kind of tied in with action. You think of the virtuous woman is, is a very good place to get a, a, a comprehensive idea of what virtue is. Proverbs chapter 31 describes the virtuous woman, a woman who's doing good things and is about good things. And it just lists off the hard work ethic and, and keeping her priorities right and watching out for her household. You know, the, the strength and the working hard, those are all good attributes of a virtuous woman, a woman who is doing good. So, what well, we start with faith, and from faith we want to start doing good. Right? Makes sense, right? Even after you get saved, hey, we start doing good. We, if we believe God's word, we start with the faith and say, okay, here's our starting point. We're going to have faith in God's word. We're going to have faith in the Bible. Faith that this is true, now let's just start doing and you can start doing good. You can start having virtue without even having all knowledge. Those knowledge comes later. Knowledge is the next thing. But God wants us taking those steps of obedience and just doing virtuous things because you have the faith. You don't have to have all the understanding. We don't have to understand all of the whys. Why? Well, why? Why, God? Why do I have to do this? Why can't I do this? Why can't I? You know, it's like little kids. Why can't I touch that? And it's a stove, right? And, and, and you've got the, 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 the coil on the electric stove and it's glowing orange and it looks really cool and the kid's going, no, don't touch it. Why can't I touch that? You don't have to understand why. Yeah, just listen to me. It's going to be good for you. Okay? Now, eventually they understand. Hopefully they don't learn by doing because that's one way of gaining knowledge is just by experience. I learned the hard way in my life on many things, and the glowing little cigarette lighter thing that looked really cool. I stuck my thumb in that one time. Oh man, I never did that again. It's a lot easier to learn just by having the faith that, you know what, when mom and dad say don't touch it, I'm just gonna believe them. <laughs> I'm just gonna do good from that. I don't have to experience it. So we can do good, we can have virtue just by having the faith. But let's add to that. It's not that knowledge is bad. I'm just saying you don't have to have all that knowledge in order to just do right. You don't have to understand why God said to do something. Let's just do it. Have the obedience. Have the faith to say, I'm going to do what's right because God said so. But let's add to that virtue knowledge so that we do know why we're not supposed to do it. That'll help you even more. It's going to increase and help you to not be unfruitful or not to be blind. God doesn't want us blind. He wants us to have knowledge. He wants us to have the understanding. 
He wants us to be able to continue and do more. So we add to that virtue, but the first step is faith. The second step is virtue. Just start doing good. Do right. And then add knowledge to that. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter number 1. If you want to gain knowledge, you want wisdom, which is on this list of things that, that, we, that I consider to be essentials in the Christian life, start studying the Proverbs. Not just read the Proverbs, study the Proverbs. Get wisdom, get understanding, get knowledge. The whole purpose, we're going to start in Proverbs chapter 1 because it's going to explain what the purpose of the book of Proverbs is. What is it going to do for you if you can read this and apply it to your life? What are the Proverbs going to do? Proverbs 1, verse number 1, the Proverbs of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction. Right off the bat, he's saying, here are the Proverbs, and the purpose of this is to know wisdom and instruction, to perceive the words of understanding, to receive the instruction of wisdom, justice, and judgment, and equity, Verse number four, to give subtlety to the simple, to the young man, knowledge and discretion. A wise man will hear and will increase learning, and a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. So knowledge is going to start with just fearing God. Just fear God. You say, how does that work? <laughs> what, what does the one have to do with the other? Well, as you go through the book of Proverbs, what do you find in the book of Proverbs? You're going to find a lot of warnings. right? You're warning, warned about the strange woman, right? the adulteress. We're warned about the wicked people who are saying, oh, hey, you know, come join us, and we're going to go you know, get money, and we're going to rob and steal, we're going to do all this stuff. It's warning. Now, don't go down that path. The wicked lay, lay a snare for themselves. You're going to fall into a trap. You think you're laying a trap for someone else and it's going to come back on you because God's going to bring it back around upon you again. And we get all these warnings and warning about the alcohol and warning about greed and warning about so many other things in this life. We're getting warnings. And when you have the faith, we understand, hey, these are the words of God. God is not a respecter of persons. God is going to judge. And as a father, as a loving father, God is going to discipline his children. And if he's telling us not to do something, well, you're a real smart person <laughs> if you obey him. And that, that's, that gives you that knowledge, just having that knowledge of going, I'm not going to go against God because if I do, he's going he's gonna to beat me. <laughs> he's gonna, I don't want to suffer. Now, thank God he's not going to kick us out of the family. He's not going to send us to hell. But he is going to, to bring punishment upon us because he loves us. He wants us going down the right path. So the fear of the Lord, understanding that. And, and this is where we don't want to get to, you know, we believe salvation is by grace through faith. And that it is very easy. You can call, label what we believe here as easy believism. That salvation is easy for us, for us. It wasn't easy for Christ. Christ did all the hard work. He lived the perfect life. That wasn't easy. He endured the shame, even the shame of the cross. He died on that cross. He suffered and bled and died. He did the hard work for us. But for us, it's as easy as receiving a gift. It's as easy as walking through a door. It's as easy as taking a drink of water. It's as easy as, as take it, eating a piece of bread. That's easy. It's easy for us wasn't easy for him but you don't want to take that to the extreme of just saying well because we're saved then we can just do whatever we want as if there's no sin and there's no consequence for sin because i'm saved yes the consequence of hell is removed when a person is saved amen christ paid for all of that and we get a pardon for our sins from the punishment of hell and we don't have to worry about that. But just because you don't have to worry about hell doesn't mean that you don't need a proper fear of the Lord because God will recompense unto us when we sin. 
He will chasten us. The Bible says the Lord chastens every son whom he receives. Every son. He won't kick you out of the family, but don't just, just think like, oh, well, I could just do whatever I want. It's the same way my children don't have to worry about me putting them in my oven and turning on broil and just locking them in there. That, they don't have to worry about that no matter what they do. No matter how bad they behave at home, I'm not going to do that. But that doesn't mean, just because I'm not going to do that doesn't mean, hey, we'll just do whatever we want. <laughs> Forget about what Dad says. He's not going to lock us in the oven. Who, so, <laughs> no. No, we'll see how well that works. <laughs> of course, I'm going to chase them and discipline and punish them. They're going to get that. We are too. And if we're smart, we'll listen to God and not have to experience it for ourselves. Let's get that wisdom. Let's get that knowledge through the fear of the Lord. And you know what? The fear of the Lord, that's just the beginning of knowledge. That's not the end of knowledge. That's where a starting point. That's a very good starting point. Just saying, you know what? I may not understand this, but I'm going to obey God anyways because the Bible says it and I'm going to trust in the wisdom of God since God knows what's right for me. God knows better than I do just as, just as much, if, well, even more than I know what's right for my children. Right? We make rules for our children because we know what's right more than they do to guide them in the right path. Well, way more than that increase of knowledge that we have over our children, God has over us. So he's given us rules. Not to make us suffer, but for our own good, for our own benefit. So we need to follow these rules. And as you grow and as you learn, you start off with the fear of the Lord, but as you continue, and, and if you're making the right choice, you can start looking around going, oh, now it's starting to make more sense to me why God wanted me to do this or not to do that. As you live, as you grow, you're going to start seeing maybe other people go down that path and you go, oh, Oh, I see. Yeah, it said it here in the Bible, but now I see it happening in real life. This is why God didn't want me doing that. Fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But we, again, we need to continue adding to that. It's not something you just um, finish. Now, tying in, again, these, uh, this list in the, in the Christian life here from 2 Peter chapter 1, we start with faith, and then we have virtue. Virtue is doing good. And we add to virtue knowledge. Now, giving counsel to somebody, that would be considered virtuous, right? That's a good thing. Giving advice to somebody. You could be well-intentioned. You have a friend. I want to give good advice to them. That's virtue. But we want to make sure that we're giving advice based on good counsel. The Bible says in Job 38, when, when you know, if you, if you know the book of Job, and Job has his friends, and they're just kind of just railing on him and rebuking him. It's all through the book of Job. He's got these miserable comforters when he's going through like the lowest point in his life ever. And they're just telling him, oh man, you're in sin. You did this, you did that. And it's not because of what Job did. It's because Satan was attacking him. And they're just blaming him for everything. And then when, that, when the, the last guy is speaking to him, God shows up. And in Job 38, verse 1, the Bible says, Then the Lord answered Job out of the world and said, Who is this that darkeneth counsels by words without knowledge? That guy's just, just, just trying to give his advice and give his counsel. And God's saying, This guy's darkening. He's not shedding light on anything. He's actually, dark. He's actually doing more harm. Even though he may be trying to do something virtuous, because he doesn't have the knowledge, he's actually doing harm. He's darkening counsel by words without knowledge. So that's why it's important not just to have the virtue, but we want to add to the virtue knowledge. Because then the, the virtue that you're doing will actually be uh, worth something and worth more. Uh, to flip over to Proverbs chapter 2, because the good news about knowledge is that God really wants you to have it. God wants you to have knowledge. He wants you to have understanding. This isn't something that he's really holding back. This is attainable to everybody. Everybody. You say, well, I'm not that smart of a person. God will give you the knowledge, but you have to want it and you have to work for it. But he will give it to you. Look at verse number three of Proverbs chapter two. The Bible says, yea, if thou criest after knowledge, crying after knowledge, that is having a serious desire to get knowledge. That isn't just, oh yeah, it'd be good if I had some extra knowledge. 
You're crying after knowledge. You want it. You desire to have knowledge. Yea, if thou criest after knowledge and liftest up thy voice for understanding, if thou seekest her as silver and searchest for her as for hid treasure. I mean, think about how much people invest in, in these treasure hunts, right? I mean, they're investing all this time and money and they're renting stuff and we're going out, man. we got this treasure map and we're going to go and find this gold and find... The way that people will do that, he's saying, if you seek wisdom and knowledge and with that same type of zeal and passion, he said, if you seek it like that, verse 5, then shalt thou understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So then you're going to find it. Then you'll get it. For the Lord giveth wisdom. Out of his mouth cometh knowledge and understanding. God will give it to you. Verse 7, he layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. He is a buckler to them that walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Now notice in verse 7 it says, he layeth up sound wisdom for the righteous. And what was the second step for add to your faith? Virtue. Virtue is doing right, doing good things. So you start doing, going along that path, you start doing right. He's going to give you the wisdom. He's going to add to that and give you that wisdom for the righteous. He's a buckler that will walk uprightly. He keepeth the paths of judgment and preserveth the way of his saints. Then shalt thou understand righteousness and judgment and equity, yea, every good path. When wisdom entereth into thine heart and knowledge is pleasant unto thy soul, discretion shall preserve thee, understanding shall keep thee. These are good things. God promises to give it to us. And then in, uh, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. But in James chapter 1, also the Bible tells us, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally. He's saying if you lack wisdom, if you feel like I'm not that smart, I'm not that wise, I need more knowledge, go to God and ask him. Because he'll give it to you. He says he giveth to all men liberally. And not, not just sparingly, not just like, well, here's a little bit. God wants you to have all wisdom. But go to God for it. Go to God's word for it. Listen to God. Don't, and, and see, don't just ask God and never pick up the book of wisdom that he's given us. Don't expect to hear something audible from God just because you said, hey, God, I want to have wisdom. I'm waiting. Talk to me. He's already talking to you. We've got it right here. You don't, you don't need to wait for the answer of, of some sign or wonder or voice. He's given us the instruction. It's all contained here. We can listen to him this way. And God will give liberally too. He'll help you to have the understanding in your brain, but, but, but be listening to him. Hear from him. Seek it out. Invest the time and the energy into reading into God's word and studying. But in, in verse number six of James one, where I was reading, that says, hey, let him ask of God, God will all men liberally, abradeth not, it shall be given him. But then it says in verse six, but let him ask in faith, nothing wavering. So notice we go back to, what was the first thing? Faith. Add to your faith virtue, add to your virtue knowledge. So when you're looking for that knowledge, you have to have the faith. That's the building block. Right? So ask in faith. Don't just ask like doubting that, that well, is God even going to do this? No, we need to have faith. If you have a problem getting knowledge, maybe you need to increase your faith a little bit. That'll help you the rest of the way down. And that's what I was talking about. We're going to see that again as we continue through some of these other characteristics, how other of the same things are referenced in many other passages in Scripture. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9 is where I had you turn to. So now the next element we're adding to our knowledge, temperance. Adding temperance. What does it mean to be temperate? Well, 1 Corinthians 9 is going to give us a good understanding or definition of, be, of being temperate. But you think about if someone has a temper. What does it mean? If someone, if someone loses their temper, it means they get all angry and kind of out of control, right? When someone loses their anger, or lose, excuse me, loses their temper, because it's tied in with what the word temperance means. Temperance means you're controlling yourself. You're controlling your body. You're controlling your emotion. It's being in control when you're in temperance, when you have temperance, where you could exhibit 
temperance. You know, people talk about like doing things in moderation. When you're moderating, that's showing temperance. You really like this food or ice cream or cookies, or but when you're temperate, you can control yourself and say, I am not just going to overindulge. I will have a little bit because that'll be okay for me. I'm not going to go further than that. That is being temperate with yourself. That's having temperance. Verse uh, number 24 in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, we'll see this. Verse number 24 says, Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that ye may obtain. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. So anyone, and here is referring to this, to a race, right? People running a race. Athletes who run a race and they want to win the prize. Athletes need to be very temperate with their life, do they not? I mean, if you're, if you want to, if you're going to run a race in the Olympics and you're running against people from all over the world and you want to be the best and you want to win the prize against everyone else, you have to be temperate in your life. You can't just overindulge in anything. You have to be rigid. You have to be strict. You've got to be on a schedule. You've got to have the right amount of sleep. You've got to understand everything that's coming into your body, how much you're working, how much you're training, all the stuff you're doing, you're controlling the fleshly lusts and desire to, to be lazy, to overeat, to do all these various things. You are in control of your body, right? So he's not talking, though, about a physical race. He's relating the way that someone is temperate in all things to win a physical prize to your spiritual life and how you need to be temperate in the same regard, not necessarily over the physical things, but over what you're doing with your time, what you're doing for your Lord, you know, where your mind is and all these various things to, in order to win the prize. He says, continuing on verse 25, that they're temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, so fight I, not as one that beateth the air, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. So he's saying, I keep under my body, I keep my body in subjection. I am in control. And that's what temperance is. So when you've got the faith, you've added virtue to your faith, you start doing good, and then you start getting knowledge. Well, now with the knowledge, we need to put that into practice. So when God's saying not to do this and not to do that, and you're getting this knowledge, you need to exhibit temperance and start controlling your body with this newfound knowledge that you have. Now I'm seeing the Bible saying, oh, I can't do this. You know, we're, you're talking about honey being a good thing in the book of Proverbs, the book of wisdom, right? They're saying, but if you have too much, you're going to vomit, right? Yeah, honey tastes great, but you can't overdo it. So now you've got to start showing temperance and, and, and withholding things from yourself in order to stay in line with the knowledge that you've received. Let's go on to the next one. Next one is patience. Turn, if you would please, to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26. Another, another word that we'll find that goes uh, closely associated with patience is long-suffering. When you have patience, you're, you're, you have long suffering, you suffer long, you're, you're able to get through tough situations without quitting, without breaking down. You're able to endure when you can show patience, right? You know, someone's trying your patience, you heard that phrase, or someone's maybe doing things to try to make you upset and to make you angry. Well, you're exhibiting temperance and control over yourself by not flying off the handle, by not losing your temper. But in order to do that, you need to have patience to get through that in addition to your temperance, right? In Acts chapter 26, the reason why we're going there is it's going to help to give the, uh, uh, you know, the way that the Bible is using the word patience. It, I know it's a pretty easy word to understand, but let's just, let's go through it anyways. Verse number two, the Bible says, I think myself happy King Agrippa because I shall answer for myself this day before thee, touching all the things whereof I am accused of the Jews, especially because I know thee to be expert in all customs and questions which are among the Jews. Wherefore, I beseech thee to hear me patiently. So, 
The Apostle Paul is glad that he's able to speak. Someone's going to listen to him. He's able to speak for himself. He's been charged with these false accusations and stuff. And he's saying, Agrippa, I'm really thankful because I know that you're already knowledgeable in this area of, of the Jews and their teachings and things like that. So I, I'm really thankful. Now, just please let me speak and hear me patiently, meaning don't cut me off. Don't stop me. Don't just, just judge a matter before you hear it. Hear me out. Let me speak all the way through until I get to the end and then consider. And that's what it means to be patient is that you're not just being quick to judge. Remember, I was preached on this a couple weeks ago, just being real quick to judge, quick to answer things, answering a matter before you hear it. That's foolishness. We need to have patience and be able to endure. And oftentimes, even just being patient in, in so many areas, being patient when you're being falsely accused. Don't quit or don't make irrational decisions or, or jump too fast necessarily and be hasty. Be patient to endure because oftentimes these things will work themselves out. If you can stay the course and if you can keep doing what's right, eventually, you know, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that are called according to his promise. When you are focused on doing what's right before God, you don't have to right every wrong. You don't have to answer everything that comes against you. You can just keep doing right, but have the patience to know with your, from your faith what's going to happen in the outcome. And patiently endure. In Colossians chapter 1, Actually, turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 5. I'll read for you from Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, the Bible reads, For this cause we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that ye might be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding, that ye might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Now notice all the things that, we're, uh, that I'm reading for you in Colossians chapter 1. I know you don't have this right in front of you right now, but it says that he's desiring that you'd have knowledge and wisdom and understanding. And he says that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing. So he's talking about knowledge. He's talking about having virtue. He's talking about being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge. So all the things that we saw in 2 Peter chapter 1 or some of the things, right? We saw all these things in, in 2 Peter chapter 1. And then in verse 11 it says, Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long suffering with joyfulness. They all go together. Everything fits together. And it fits together perfectly when we go through Scripture. How much? Are you talking about being fruitful? Well, we've got the same attributes coming up here again. Romans chapter 5 is where I do turn. Look at verse number 3. Because patience is often learned through trials and tribulations, through hard times. That's, that's the best way to learn patience. Because patience is something that's tried. And when I say you know, tried is going through trials. You're tested. You don't really know how much patience you have or how you can even improve on that until you start going through harder things. And every time you go through something hard, It'll help build on your patience. When you, when you have children, right, um, at first, with the first one, they're crying or whatever, you know, it, it's easier to lose your patience. But then the more you go through it, the more you experience, you're like, okay, yeah, this, this again. And, and you have that understanding and that extra knowledge of the experience, and it will help you to gain the extra patience going through. In Romans 5, verse number 3, the Bible says, And not only so, but we glory in tribulations also. You say, why would you glory in tribulations? It's not fun to be going through tribulations, going through hard times. He's like, we glory in it. Why? Knowing that tribulation worketh patience. Even though it's not fun having the tribulation. I mean, it's, it's hard times. That's why it's called tribulation. It's not just like a party. Okay? But the reason why we can still have joy over this is because we can know that, hey, while I'm going through this, this is going to make me stronger. This is going to give me more patience. This is going to help me to endure when things get even harder. And he says in verse 4, and patience, experience, and experience, hope. Because as you continue to go through, and then you add to that patience your experience, and you're going, oh, wow, I've been through this before. 
oh yeah, I made it through this already. I can do this again. And that's going to increase your patience as you go through the harder times. Uh, we're going to have to turn. Turn, if you would, to 1 Timothy chapter 2. I'm going to read from Hebrews chapter 6. I don't want to spend too much time in, in, in any one of these places because I'm, I'm running out of time. I want to make sure I have enough to finish the sermon. I'm going to read for you from, from Hebrews chapter 6. Hebrews 6.11 reads, And we desire that every one of you do show the same diligence to the full assurance of hope unto the end, that you be not slothful, but followers of them who through faith and patience inherit the promises. For when God made promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself, saying, Surely blessing I will bless thee, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. And that brings up how patient Abraham was when God promised him a son. So God, Abraham had to have the faith that God was going to remain true to his word. But then, because it was going on for a long time, he had to endure and endure patiently, just knowing, knowing from God's word, with the faith in God's word, as he's doing right, with patience, he received the promise. Great example of, of, of having that level of patience that, that God is, is telling us that if we have these things, we will be fruitful and will abound. The next one, we add to our patience, godliness. Godliness. So that's being godly. And, again, and you know, oftentimes when I know what a word is, just think about the opposite. right? What's ungodly? Well, a lot of things you can think of that are ungodly. Well, godly is the exact opposite of those things, right? Godliness, being like God, having, having God-like attributes. We look at the attributes of the Lord, look at the attributes of God. That's like godliness. Verse number uh, 9, I had you turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, look at verse number 9. The Bible reads, In like manner also that women adorn themselves in modest apparel with shamefacedness and sobriety, not with broidered hair or gold or pearls or costly array, but which becometh women professing godliness with good works. So here it's talking about women. If a woman's professing, oh, I'm really godly. I have godliness. What's gonna, what is going to show that godliness? Good works. That's going to show your godliness, right? Having those good works works will demonstrate that you have godliness. Flip over to chapter 4, 1 Timothy chapter 4. The verse, uh, chapter, excuse me, verse number 7 reads, But refuse profane and old wives' fables, and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profiteth little, but godliness is profitable unto all things, having promise of the life that now is, and of that which is to come. So having this attribute of being godly and doing godly things and having good works is profitable unto all things. And then flip over to chapter number 6 in 1 Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter number 6. We're going to give one more example of, of what godliness is not. And what does not come from godliness to help us understand what is godliness. 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse number 5 says, Perverse disputings of men of corrupt minds and destitute of the truth, supposing that gain is godliness. There's people out there that think that because you have a lot of money, because you've gained a lot financially in this world, that that all of a sudden makes you godly. And this is the, uh, the name it, claim it type of crowd, right? That's out there going, oh, well, I have so much faith. That's why God's given me so much money and so many fancy cars and clothing and jets and everything else. It's because I'm a man of God and I've got so much faith and God just give it. You know, I, you say you want that car, whatever, you know, God will give that to you. You know, all this, this garbage and this nonsense that's just completely focused on the wrong things, on the things of this world. And, and there are people out there that, even the Bible's saying here, they suppose that gain is godliness. They're completely wrong. 
That has nothing to do with godliness. That's why it says, from such, withdraw thyself. Are we going to join hands with these, these name and claim and crowd Christians and, and go out and do No, we're going to withdraw ourselves from them. We have nothing to do with them. You suppose that gain is godliness. I don't want to be around people like that. The Bible says withdraw ourself from them. So I'm going to withdraw myself from them. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Doing good, having good works, acting godly, doing the right thing, and just being content with what you have and not even desiring to have all these riches and everything else in this world. Just being satisfied with where you're at, that is great gain. That is the real gain. Say, I'm just going to do what's right. It, has no, it doesn't matter what riches or wealth is added to me or not added to me. I don't care because it's not about that. I'm not in it for filthy lucre's sake. I have, no, I have no cares about that. I'm working for rewards in heaven, not here on earth. So whatever happens in this lifetime, whatever. That's going to perish with this world anyways. That doesn't show me how godly you are. I don't care how much money you have. That doesn't show me that you're godly. You know how many wicked people in this world have a whole bunch of money? Are you going to turn around and call them godly? That gain has nothing to do with godliness. Nothing. Job was the most righteous man in the world in his time. You can look at Job. Job had a lot of wealth. Yeah, but you know what? God took it all away from him too. And he was still righteous. He was still the most righteous man on the earth when God took it all away. So whether you're abound or whether you're abased, you know what? We need to be content in all things. Because that is not the indicator. And be careful that you're not looking at someone going, oh man, now because you don't have any wealth, you must have done something wrong. Because that's what Job's friends did to him. You did something wrong. You don't have any more wealth. Not always the case. Sometimes, maybe. Sometimes you get, you get, you know, you definitely get judged for your own sins. And God will bring some chastisement, and maybe He will take away some of your wealth, but you can't presume to know that about someone, especially when you don't see and have any evidence to know anything about them doing anything wrong. Because they had nothing to accuse Job of other than, well, you've lost your stuff. So you must have done something wrong. No. No. One thing that if you're living godly in Christ Jesus is that you shall suffer persecution. You're going to go through tribulation. You're going to go through hard times. That's something that's promised. So maybe if you see someone and you have no reason to think to the contrary that they've done any, you haven't witnessed any sin, there's no accusations even coming against someone. There was no accusation against Job. He was doing everything he was supposed to be doing. In general, obviously he was a sinner like, like you know, because he was a human being. But he was not living some, some wicked life that he needed to be judged for and chastised for either. He went through persecution. He suffered. Because all who will live godly for Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So these people who think that godliness is gain, we withdraw ourselves from them. Uh, that, excuse me, that gain is godliness. But godliness with contentment is great gain. Jump down to verse number 10. For the love of money is the root of all evil. So these people that want to focus on all the riches of this world, hey, that's the root of all evil. That's why you withdraw yourself from those people who are focused so much on these riches. Amen. These greedy people, these greedy, money-hungry pastors that are doing so much damage to the cause of Christ and turning people away in droves because they're being used and abused. And they say, if that's what church is, if that's what God is, I want to have nothing to do with it. And people get ruined by these wolves that are just out to fleece the sheep. And they don't care about the people. They just care about themselves and they care about money. And they should be accursed. People who, for the love of money, will trample on other people because they, they don't care at all. They have a wicked heart full of wicked practices. The Bible says, The love of money is the root of all evil, which while some coveted after, they have erred from the faith and pierced themselves through with many sorrows. And that's kind of interesting, too, because no matter how much money these people have that are wicked and they just love to have money and they're covetous, they're never going to be happy. They pierce themselves through sorrows. 
That's why they always want more because they think that's still going to, it's going to somehow, some way bring them happiness. They're never going to get it. God has that built in to greed that you just are going to be pierced through with many sorrows. It's never going to satisfy you. Verse 11, but thou, O man of God, flee these things, run away from them, and follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, meekness. Look at that. Righteousness, virtue, godliness, faith, patience. See a pattern developing here? Now let's move on. We got the last two. The last two attributes. I don't have much time left. Brotherly kindness and charity. We add the godliness. The godliness is a pretty high virtue. I mean, it's a pretty high characteristic to have, being, being like God, you know, following, doing the, all these good things like God. Uh, brotherly kindness. Turn to, um, turn to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. I'm going to read from Romans chapter 12. Romans 12, 9 reads, Let love be without dissimulation, meaning it's not fake. You're not simulating your love for someone. Let your love be without dissimulation. You're not faking it. Abhor that which is evil. Hate it. Hate the evil. Cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affectioned one to another with brotherly love. In honor preferring one another. Brotherly love or brotherly kindness is when you're looking on your brother or your sister in Christ and having that affection towards them where you're preferring them over you. Where you are uh, being kindly affection and it says in honor preferring one another. You're not looking to exalt yourself. You're looking to help the other person out. 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse number 6, the Bible reads that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Obviously, you're not being kind to someone if you're defrauding your brother. You're cheating him out of something. You're lying about something. You're tricking him. Because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. There's a little bit of knowledge, a little bit of fear of the Lord, right, coming in there. Don't defraud your brother, because you know what? God's going to avenge him. And of all people, and think about that, of all people in the world where God's going to right wrongs, you know, we know that as believers, that as we are, have wrong done to us, that God is our defense, God sees everything, God's going to make everything right. You know, we could take comfort in that, and usually we're thinking, like, against the heathen and against other people. You know, they're going to get their day. They're going to get what's coming to them eventually. We just need to focus on doing what's right. But knowing that, now think about you doing something to another one of God's children. Just as much as he's going to help you, because we think about, we apply that to ourselves, right? Well, God's going to protect me, and God's going to look out for me, because I'm a child of God, and, and, and he is, and amen. But when you think about defrauding someone else, hey, the same way that you think God's going to be there to protect you, God's also going to be there for your brother or your sister that you're now trying to defraud and you're trying to harm. You know, watch out. And that's why he's saying it. You know, be forewarned. Don't go down that path. For God hath not called us unto uncleanness, verse 7, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit, but as touching brotherly love, you need not that I write unto you, for ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed, ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. And here we see the concept of they have brotherly love. He's saying, you know what? I know, you know this already. God's already told you you're supposed to love. And he says, but we're going to beseech you anyways, brethren, increase more and more and more. Increase that brotherly love. Add to that. Let's not just be good enough with, with a surface level brotherly love. Go beyond. Increase. I'll read it for you. You don't have to turn. Or turn if you would to 1 Corinthians 13. 1 John 2, verse number 9, the Bible reads, He that saith he is in the light and hateth his brother is in darkness even until now. He that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. 
But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. And again, in 2 Peter chapter 1, if you remember, they're saying if you don't have these things, then you're blind. And the Bible's saying here, you hate your brother, you're in darkness, you walk in darkness, basically your eyes are blinded. You need to have that brotherly love, brotherly kindness towards uh, your brothers and sisters in Christ. And then Galatians 6.10, the Bible reads, As we have therefore opportunity, let us do good unto all men, especially unto them who are of the household of faith. The Bible wants us to be good to everybody, but that brotherly kindness, that, that's something you should have even more love and more kindness and, you know, for your brothers and sisters in Christ. Because they're, why? They're your family. They're, they're, they should be special to you and closer to you than just any random person in the world. Hey, be good to all men, but especially be good to those of the household of faith. Last point, charity. And charity, honestly, deserves an entire sermon in and of itself. So there's no way I'm going to do justice to charity itself. But 1 Corinthians chapter 13 is known as the charity chapter. This really goes in depth talking about what, you know, the attributes of having charity. And charity, multiple times in the Bible, is kind of the, the end of our faith, right? Like that is kind of a, a, a crowning achievement is to have a life of charity. Charity is exalted. Even at the end of 1 Corinthians 13, the last verse says, And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is charity. That God has a higher value on these different attributes. And he's like, charity is, hey, faith, that's pretty high, right? We should have a lot of faith. Hope, we should have a lot of hope. Charity, God says, well, charity is the greatest. And one way to remember just what charity is, because we oftentimes will think of charity as being, uh, it has kind of been reduced to, oh, if you give money to the poor, or give money to a cause, that's charity. Not by definition, not by biblical definition, it's not. Giving money to something is not charity. Because charity is something that comes from your heart, it comes from within. Lots of people give money to causes and donations and do not have charity in their heart. Lots of people give money to be seen of men, to bring glory unto themselves, to look like they're this great philanthropist and that they want to be seen of men and to be loved of men. And basically they're buying that with their money. They're not charitable. The cause may be good, but they are not charitable. That's why in 1 Corinthians 13, look at what Paul says in, in verse number one. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And we're going to go through many of these things. You can have certain great attributes and things, but you can have those things without charity, and it's going to mean nothing. He said, I can speak with the tongues of men and of angels. I can know these languages and have this great knowledge, but if I don't have charity, when I speak, it doesn't really matter. Verse number two, and though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could remove mountains and have not charity, I am nothing. So notice, he's bringing up a lot of things that are important. I call them the Christian life essentials that we need to have in our life. That second Peter chapter one was going over, hey, you need to have this and this and add to this and add to that. And then finally, add to all these things, charity. Because without the charity is the glue holding everything together. Because even if you have all those other areas of your life, man, I've got knowledge, man, I've got godliness, I've got all this. But if you don't have charity, it's all going to be for naught. Verse number three, and, and this is where I was talking about with the giving of money. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. You can look at that and be like, man, look at that charity. I mean, this guy sold all that he had. He's just like, here you go. I want to feed the poor. Though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. So is it possible to give all your goods to feed the poor and not have charity? Absolutely. Because the Bible is saying, if I don't have charity, then it's nothing. So what is charity? The easiest way to remember what charity is, is think of the word care. 
Because charity is a type of love. It's something that comes from within. And the, the, the root of the word care and the word charity are coming from basically the same root. So caring, when you're caring for someone else, it has something, it's, it's a love that's expressed that is, that is putting someone else's being in, in, above your own. Charity is when you care more about others than yourself. And when you're motivated by helping others. That's the charity. It's not motivate, it's not self-motivation. It's other motivation. The John the Baptist exhibited charity when he came on the scene and he was getting people, he was gathering a following, and he's baptizing people and he's preaching the word of God. But then he was pointing people to Jesus because it wasn't about himself. So he's saying, behold, the Lamb of God. And he's saying, follow him. And he had his followers saying, no, follow him. He wasn't trying to lift himself up. He wasn't trying to make this great name for himself. He was there for the purpose of serving Jesus Christ. He's saying, no, follow him. I'll help you, but go over there. He wasn't trying to do anything for himself. That is charity. That is real love. That is real caring for someone. No, I'm just a man. Follow the Christ. Verse number four, we're going to see some attributes of charity. Charity suffereth long. There's your patience. And is kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself is not puffed up. So suffering long, being having patience, being kind, not envying, not being greedy, not desiring other things. Not lifting itself up in pride. Verse 5, doth not behave itself unseemly. Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil. Rejoiceth not in iniquity, but rejoiceth in the truth. Beareth all things. And again, long-suffering, right? Being able to bear things, having patience. Believing all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never faileth. Having that caring, that love, this charity, this, this charity that's being exalted never fails. Never stops. Always there for others. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. There's not always going to be this knowledge and prophecies and tongues that like we saw in the Bible. They'll stop. They'll fail. But you know what? Charity never fails. It should always be charity. Verse 9, for we know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know, even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. And there's lots of other passages we go to about charity, but like I said, that's an entire sermon in and of itself. We want to make sure, if we want to be fruitful, we need to be adding continually our faith, virtue, knowledge, temperance, right? All of these things. We need to add the um, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, charity. They're all important. But, but don't leave without, I think, the, the, the emphasis and the focus needs to be on the charity. That is the most important because without that, everything else, nothing, nothing's going to fall into line. You can be the most, you know, some people exalt, I think, over-exalt wisdom to the point of, you know, I'm going to lock myself in my study and I'm going to read all these books and I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it. But they're never going out and helping people. They're never really using that knowledge for any good, and all of that knowledge that they amass is for naught. It's for nothing. It's for yourself. Is, is that the example that Christ left for us? Is to just focus on knowledge and get as much knowledge as you can for yourself so you can show people how smart you are and, and be lifted up with pride and, tell, and, and talk down to people because they don't know what you know. No. That's why the Bible says, wisdom puffeth up, but charity edifieth. 
Christ lived charity. Christ is charity. He did nothing for himself. When he walked on this earth, he did everything for everyone else but himself. Come to our Wednesday night Bible study, we're reading through the Gospel of Matthew, and we're seeing how much Christ did for others. Even when he's tired, even when his friend goes to prison, his friend gets beheaded, he's going off somewhere to be alone, to pray with God, and there's all these people that surround him. And what does he do? He heals them. He preaches to them. He teaches them. He helps them. And then he continues on to go off and be alone, praying in the middle of the night, and then going off and finding his way. You know, when's the guy sleeping? When's the guy doing anything really for himself? He's not. He's doing everything for others. So much to the point to where he sacrifices his own body and soul and pours out himself for others. That's charity. That's real love. Greater love hath no man than this, and a man lay down his life for his friends. That's the mindset we want to have. And, and if you get that in your heart, and you get that in your mind, and then start working on all these other areas, and, and, and improving, and getting the wisdom, and getting the virtue, and getting the patience, and getting the knowledge, get, getting the, the, the faith, increasing in all these areas, you will be fruitful. And you will be doing exactly what God wants for you to do in this life. Let's bow our heads have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for uh, all the instruction that you give us. Lord, I know there's a lot of things that we covered today. God, help us all to, to inflect upon ourselves and to analyze our life and see where do we need to improve more. God, help us to identify the areas where we're kind of lacking and we're failing we don't want to be unfruitful, Lord. We want to be fruitful. We want to do good by you. Uh, please help us to have more wisdom and knowledge and, um, and especially the charity, Lord. Work on our hearts. Help us to, um, to really care about other people and to think on them and, and to do things motivated that will honestly help other people without regard for ourselves and our own wants and desires, Lord. We want to have the same mindset that Christ had. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.